Welcome to All That's Left, a podcast from Left Voice. My name is Odin. Today, I'm digging into the history of the U.S. revolutionary left and Trotskyism with Brian Palmer, a historian focusing on labor and the left, who is a lifelong advocate of revolutionary politics. He's written extensively on American communism and Trotskyism, and on James P. Cannon, who is the founder of American Trotskyism and one of the main focuses of our episode today. In addition to discussing James P. Cannon, Brian Palmer and I also talk about the broader U.S. socialist movement at the start of the 20th century, including the U.S. Socialist Party and Communist Party, as well as class struggle in the 1920s and 30s. And we also discuss Stalinism and the common turn and the founding of the Fourth International, among other topics that are key to understanding the history of the revolutionary left. I learned a lot from this conversation and I really enjoyed it and I hope you all do too. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Our pleasure, definitely. I I wanted to start a little bit by asking about your your motivations for writing about James Buchanan and early US Trotskyism in particular because relatively speaking, there seems to be quite a bit written about the involvement of the the Communist Party in labor struggles and civil rights struggles during this era, but not as many historians have uh, given attention to the Trotskyist movement. So um, what motivated you to write about the early history of U.S. Trotskyism, and why in your work do you focus on James P. Cannon in particular? Okay, well... I mean, one answer would be a very simple one, but a very inadequate one, which is that um, I think Cannon and Trotskyism are an intrinsically interesting story. And as you said, they've been very much understated in the writing on the American revolutionary tradition. Um, There's virtually nothing uh, written uh, of substance about Cannon except the material, and some of it is quite good, but also limited, that came out of the movement itself his own writings, uh, the, the sort of commentaries of his, of his comrades on his death, et cetera. Um, so th- the reason that I really folk, you know, really decided, I think, to write on Canon um, was uh, it, it the, I suppose there's a dual uh, um, motivation, one intellectual and one political. Um, let me start with the intellectual, uh, and, and it really is, uh, if you look at the writing on uh, the history of American um, communism, you have kind of two, two oppositional schools, really. An old traditionalist, uh, in some sense, Cold War historiography that saw in the history of the Communist Party nothing more than Moscow domination and direction. Uh, the founding father of this, and, and he actually wrote amazingly good histories, uh, given the blinkers that his politics placed on them, was uh, Theodore Draper, who wrote two volumes at the end of the 1950s and early 60s, which are still foundational texts, I think, for anyone wanting to understand the history of the Communist Party. But the problem with Draper was that he, could not get past the notion that there really was no indigenous American revolutionary tradition. It was a foreign import, it was alien, uh, and as it followed Moscow's uh, shifting uh, lines, it was inevitably going to uh, sort of fall into uh, really traps and cul-de-sacs of uh, sort of irrelevance for the American experience. You then had a generation of new leftists uh, who sort of came of age in the 1960s and the struggles of the 1960s, who were looking desperately for that indigenous radical tradition. And they looked to the Communist Party, and there were lots of old communists around in the 60s that were willing to talk to them. Uh, They did a lot of oral histories, and they did a lot of, you know, very good research on the history of the Communist Party. Draper and his followers became, in some sense, their intellectual, you know, bete noirs. They 
they they structured their entire sort of oeuvre against the notion that this was just a foreign domination, just Moscow's uh, um, sort of imposition. And so they saw uh, the communist tradition uh, in, in the United States as being led by Native American radicals uh, who were you know, struggling against racism, uh, against the exploitation and oppressions of class experience, and for a better world, and they aligned with them. Uh, now, you know, that was that's the intellectual uh, sort of setting of a history of the American revolutionary tradition that basically ignores Trotskyism. Now, the political motivation for me writing was that you know, I had gone through the new left. I had gone through, uh, you know, various attractions to anarcho-syndicalist politics, to uh, um, uh, to politics aligned with uh, the uh, what one might call a Stalinist tradition. Uh, you know, I was close to the Progressive Labor Party uh, at the tail end of S- Students for a Democratic Society. Um, but I gravitated more and more as I kind of studied and looked at the political experience to a Trotskyist critique of the degeneration uh, of uh, the revolutionary process in Russia uh, under Stalin's leadership in the years from the late 1920s, stretching into his death in the, in, in, in the 50s. Um, Trotskyism seemed to me to have a lot of answers to what was wrong. And I think we'll come to some of those later. So I wanted to sort of resurrect the Trotskyist tradition, which had gotten lost in this, you know, oppositional, you know, uh, historiography. Um, And what the Trotskyist tradition, it seemed to me, showed very interestingly, was that you could find in the American experience uh, a revolutionary current that was both embedded in the sort of uh, traditions of the of American working class struggle that learned from the Russian Revolution of 1917 was attracted to and won over to the politics of early Bolshevism, Bolshevism, but that then broke from decisively the degeneration of that politics under Stalin. And it offered an alternative, therefore, to this oppositional historiography that said it's either, uh, you know, a standalone American radicalism or it's a Moscow, you know, foreign import. Trotskyism uh, was neither. I mean, it, it, it actually, it learned from the Russian Revolution, but it was embedded in American traditions of radicalism. It opposed Stalinization, but it sought to carry forward the best traditions of what could be learned from the early experience of Bolshevism. And canon in particular was the embodiment of that indigenous American revolutionary tradition. He was the son of Irish immigrants reared in Kansas an instinctually American uh, revolutionary who, you know, cut his teeth in radical politics in that most American of revolutionary phenomenon, the industrial workers of the world, went through the Socialist Party, gravitated to its left wing, discovered in Bolshevism and the Russian Revolution, you know, a politics that he could uh, embrace and that he thought presented answers for the American working class to which he was always almost umbilically connected. So that's really why, you know, Cannon and Trotskyism captivated me. And their history, um, which we'll talk about later, is one in which there are, you know, moments of tremendous importance that have been, in fact, bypassed by so much not only of the mainstream American uh, writing, but of even the writing of leftists uh, uh, historically.
Yeah, that's really interesting. And I do want to get to many of the themes that you just brought up and his uh, trajectory through the uh, Socialist Party in particular. But before that, I kind of wanted to set the the stage a bit and talk about the context that James P. Cannon and his um, contemporaries were were operating in. Because obviously, you know, socialism in the U.S. didn't start just in 1917, but I wanted to hear a little bit about, like, what did socialism and the left look like at the very start of the 20th century? Um, and in particular, I was curious also about what the Socialist Party looked like at this time. Yeah, it, it's um, uh, uh, the, the socialist tradition in America is stronger than we would, you know, mired in the context of our current moment think. Uh, and the Socialist Party in particular, prior to uh, um, uh, the 1920s, um, was, uh, you know, a vibrant but variegated milieu. It was, uh, in some sense, it was a catch basin for all of the radicalisms that sort of emerged out of the 19th century and that were sort of coming into a kind of new context with 20th century development of monopoly capitalism, the, the more repressive uh, uh, sort of maturing of the state, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what you had was, a, was in some senses a series of parties within parties uh, under an umbrella of this, you know, catch-all socialism. Now, the... I think the fundamental point about the Socialist Party, particularly uh, at the moment of 1917, which was a kind of world historic moment of both the Russian Revolution on the one hand, but also of world war and the threat that that posed on the other. Um, the leading element of the Socialist Party was uh, what, might, might, one, what one might call a conservative old guard. Uh, often embedded in the more, I would say, respectable and accommodated elements of an immigrant radical milieu, particularly German uh, uh, immigrants who had long traditions of socialism uh, and who were more social democratic uh, in their orientation and reformist in their orientation than they were, say, revolutionary in terms of the Bolsheviks or even the IWW. Um, gas and water socialism, if you will. They actually, you know, controlled certain uh, cities and, you know, and municipal governments in the, you know, in the Midwest. So that would be the leadership of the Socialist Party circa 1917. Um, and they had a very tepid approach to, 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 to be, to put it understatedly, towards war. That is, they weren't mobilizing for, you know, an all-out opposition to war. They tended to be uh, social patriotic and chauvinist. Um, there were, however, other elements in the Socialist Party, uh, including uh, rad more, uh, more radical elements of the immigrant community, revolutionary Jews, Finns, Latvians, Russians, who, uh, who had experienced pogroms, uh, and uh, repression in Tsarist, almost quasi-feudal-like states in, in Europe, and it escaped uh, those uh, sort of coercive uh, contexts. Um, there was also the more revolutionary tradition of Eugene Debs, who was a revered figure uh, on the left, and in some senses by 1917, almost a kind of grandfather of the of the revolutionary forces. And Debs was always a profound internationalist, very much uh, a, a revolutionary, although he had certain blind spots around race, uh, and those kinds of blind spots ran rampant in some senses through this variegated socialist milieu. And you also had gravitating to the Socialist Party uh, people like Cannon and John Reed, who were uh, drawn to uh, and came out of more radical backgrounds often associated with the IWW. I mean, it was common for, although we know of the industrial workers of the world as an anarcho-syndicalist organization, they were a revolutionary organization, and many of them 
carried Socialist Party cards as well as their red IWW card. I mean, there was there was opposition to that from the old guard, revolutionary working class advocates like Bill, Big Bill Haywood, for instance, were sort of turfed out of the IWW around 1912. Um, so what you had was this socialist like catch basin uh, in which uh, by 1917, there was boiling to the surface all kinds of factional differentiations. Um, and the war and the Russian Revolution really heightened that process. And it was out of that that you would get the beginnings of an underground communist movement that Reed, Cannon, Louis Freyna, uh, and whole contingents of Jewish and other uh, uh, immigrant, uh, often foreign language speaking revolutionaries gravitated to. Yeah, the Socialist Party is um, really interesting in its heterogene- heterogeneity, which you partly described in Cannon's own description of the Socialist Party, I found really interesting too. He used the term, I think, a, a terrible hodgepodge of ideas where surprisingly to me, um, apparently like the, the leaders weren't particularly actively Marxist and Cannon described them a little bit more as like the US counterparts of the the social democratic parties in Europe, kind of like you mentioned about the the influence of the German, German social democratic uh, tradition. So it's it is really interesting to think of what it was like before 1917 in the this terrible hodgepodge, as he put it. Yeah, um, it it's it and you know Trotsky described the Socialist Party at the time, and he'd spent a bit of time in New York City, uh, you know, prior to uh, um, the Russian Revolution. Uh, he described it, you know the leadership, for instance, as a party of uh, sort of Babbitts and dentists. Uh, you know, radical dentist. Um, that might be a bit harsh because what it neglected to see was the extent to which within that milieu you did have uh, adherents of Debs and you did have traditions that, you know, uh, were far more uh, revolutionary and radical. Um, and uh, it all came to a head at a Socialist Party convention in 1918 where there was actually a three way split. And, uh, you know, with with people marching out of the convention and setting up another convention and the police actually being called by the conservative leadership to, you know, thwart the 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 the, the sort of oppositional elements. Um, and it's it's a. Um, it is a hodgepodge, but, it, you know, you have to remember, too, that this is a moment in which the kind of notion of a disciplined party that in some senses was the creation of Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks was, you know, a totally new uh, and interventionist organizational movement uh, on the, you know, compared to what had existed in Marxist time in the 19th century, or even that, you know, American Marxists like Daniel de Leon uh, had been really, uh, um, you know, kind of aware or cognizant of. So it's a, the, the Socialist Party was both a breeding ground by 1917 for revolutionary possibility, and in some senses, a break on the realization of that revolutionary possibility. Yeah, and I think also as a, a perhaps more minor note, I think um, I we also take for granted these days as English-speaking socialists the availability, uh, the widespread availability of all of these foundational works and texts. Um, back then, they certainly didn't have, you know, Marxist.org and these sites where you could readily and easily read um, what the socialists at the time were saying and uh, their theories and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, even Cannon uh, would later write that at the time of his movement into this communist underground, he had barely read Marx. A few pamphlets, Wage, Labor, and Capital, Value, Price, and Profit, which the Deleonites had distributed and run, you know, educational classes on. That summed up largely the reading of most American, quote, Marxists uh, at the time. Das Kapital was not really available 
Uh, and very few had, weighed, had, had made any attempt to wade through it. And this was why, in some senses, the more revolutionary elements uh, of the foreign uh, uh, language speaking sectors uh, of the Socialist Party and that came into the, you know, the underground communist movement had such you know, reverence and respect on the part of the indigenous American radicals is because they could read the German. They did have more you know, contact uh, with not just the experiences of European socialism and Marxism, but also with its um, foundational texts and uh, sort of programmatic orientations. So... Like you said, James Buchanan um, joins the Socialist Party, and before that, he had been part of the the IWW and things like that. And in the Socialist Party, he joins the left wing of it, but then he helped to found the Legal Communist Party, the uh, Workers' Party, around in 19, um, 1921. Could you talk a bit more about why Cannon and his comrades at that time split with the Socialist Party? Well, fundamental uh, to that split was learning from the experience of the, the Bolsheviks there and, and, and the creation of the, of, of the first workers' republic and, and, its, and you know, the Leninist contribution uh, to uh, sort of the tr- creating the possibility of the transition from socialism to communism uh, and, and uh, the role of a disciplined party uh, that Lenin, you know, accented. Is central to this process. Um, opposition to the war uh, and not sort of gravitating uh, to the, uh, you know, social patriotism and national chauvinism that basically destroyed social democracy uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's international uh, in that period of, of, of 1914 to 1918. Uh, and the, 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 the tremendous working class upheaval of the immediate post-World War I period, epitomized in you know, general strikes and, and, and workers' mobilizations uh, in 1919. Um, all of this really sort of placed before the revolutionaries in the Socialist Party the necessity of creating a new organization that would build on, in some senses, the achievements and the clarifying perspectives of that pivotal period from sort of 1916 you know, to 1923, when so much was happening. Uh, and uh, it was really a, a process of breaking from the Socialist Party, forming underground cells, forming, uh, you know, communist nuclei in various uh, locations. Um, But not only did they have to battle breaking from the Socialist Party and its loose structure, they also had to battle in the context of the specific American conditions of the time. The notion that in some senses came over with the underground uh, European immigrant uh, milieu. Uh, in some senses, that milieu was trapped, incarcerated in the view that everything must be clandestine. Everything must be underground. We can't actually have you know, a party that's intersecting with masses of workers because the repressive capacity that we know the state and capital is going to bring down on our heads is actually too great and too destructive. Well, Cannon negotiated in some senses this fear and this insularity that was present in so many of much of the revolutionary and and largely immigrant and foreign language speaking milieu with an appreciation that bourgeois democracy did offer certain you know cracks in the wall of repression certain fissures into which an above-ground legal communist party could actually uh, move. And in moving into those fissures, they could crack open the sort of uh, barriers uh, to active involvement 
in, uh, you know, the class struggles of the time that were erupting all, you know, Great Steel Strike, the Seattle General Strike, uh, mobile, different kinds of mobilizations of workers. Much of this wouldn't come to fruition until the 30s and 40s, but its beginnings lay in that 1917 to 1923 period. And so that was really Cannon's great achievement. And it's re- it was recognized. Uh, a Jewish revolutionary named Alexander Bittelman, you know, wrote uh, about Cannon that at his best, He was like a mechanic moving among, you know, a kind of well-oiled machine of revolutionary possibility and bringing together various components of this, you know, technology of this apparatus of revolutionary uh, possibility and party building. And it was Cannon who made connections with Jewish communists uh, like Bittleman and who made uh, and who himself epitomized the Americanism of the revolutionary tradition in the IWW. He always referred to himself as a wobbly who learned something. And, you know, so it was, and and, and he actually helped to recruit William Z. Foster, who would later become, of course, a a major figure in the Communist Party, but also an arch Stalinist enemy of of Cannon's. But he, it it was Cannon and another wobbly Ralph Chaplin who first broached to Foster, why don't you come with us? Why don't you be with us? And indeed, multiplied hundreds of times. That's what Cannon was doing in this period from basically 1918 to 1921. Bringing people who agreed on much, but who also saw the world so differently from their varied experiences. Bringing them into an above-ground legal communist party, the Workers' Party, that would you know, break out of isolation and actually be able to have an impact uh, in the American working class struggles of the time. I want to get to um, Cannon and his taking up the banner of Trotskyism and kind of, I guess, jumping forward in time a little bit. Because in, I think, 1928, Cannon was then expelled from the Communist Party for supporting Trotskyism and supporting the uh, international left opposition to Stalinism. And he then helped form the Communist League of America. And from my understanding, um, a big part of the disagreements that Cannon and some of his comrades had, like um, Max Schachmann, had were um, on the question of, for example, internationalism. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about um, some of the ways that the U.S. Communist Party and the Comintern were degenerating during this time, and what really were the disagreements that led to people like Cannon um, taking up the mantle of Trotskyism and eventually being expelled from the Communist Party? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very important question and, and, and a large one. Uh, I think that, you know, to set the stage a bit to the answer to that, um, what you have to understand is that over this course of the 1920s, from 1921 to 1928, the American Communist Party, in some senses, uh, evolved not necessarily as simply an import from Moscow, but certainly uh, uh, under the direction of and uh, in a sort of symbiotic relationship with the Communist International. And in the earlier years, and I would say roughly from 1921 to 1924, 25, um, it's possible, I think, to make the argument that Cannon and others within the leadership of the American communist movement learned a great deal from the Russians and saw in the Russian guidance that was offered um, much that was good. So, for instance, in Cannon's struggle to kind of liberate American communism from the kind of insularity and clandestine underground traditions that I talked about earlier, that struggle went on even past the formation of the Communist Party because all of those, for for instance, uh, Russian-speaking clandestine, conspiratorial, uh, underground types, they still remained in the party. They were an influence. Uh, And so it went on, that struggle. 
Uh, and as Cannon struggled to bring the party to the foreground in the American experience, he had the support of people like Lenin, uh, Zinoviev, and others in the in the Comintern. You know, they were the ones who said, you know, stop this nonsense. You know, move into the open, make connections with the working class. And without that Russian and, and Bolshevik input and influence, who knows where American communism would have gone in this period. So the early common turn guidance was in some senses exemplary. But over time, and particularly with Lenin's death, uh, and Stalin's increasing, you know, and tightening grip on the apparatus of not only uh, the, the Bolshevik party, but the common turn as well. Uh, more and more, the, the Communist International would be guided not by the Leninist and Trotskyist uh, sort of uh, animating force of world proletarian revolution, but of Stalin's, you know, in Stalin's term, of building socialism in one country. So more and more foreign communist parties were judged to be, in fact, the um, uh, sort of the subordinates of Moscow. And their policies, their practices were more and more subject to dictates from Moscow. And more and more they were uh, forced to accommodate Moscow's needs rather than further advance the revolutionary prospects in their own countries. A classic, a classic examples of this were the British general strike of 1926, where the Comintern played a role of essentially uh, structuring that strikes, uh, the Communist Party's role in, in Britain in those strikes into furthering Soviet interests rather than pursuing the interests of the general strike or the sort of tragic uh, history of the revolutionary movement in China, where, uh, again, Chinese revolutionaries uh, were uh, sacrificed uh, and thousands and thousands of them killed in order to uh, accommodate uh, Russia's relationship with China uh, and, and the nationalist forces in China led by, you know, Chiang Kai-shek. So uh, in the United States, a major issue was, was how Comintern emissaries were coming and dictating to the party certain often crazy and non-communist policies, particularly around, uh, for instance, an issue like, like the Farmer Labor Party. Um, this was an issue where, you know, the, the communist uh, emissaries uh, and uh, um, uh, a figure named Pepper, uh, Joseph Pogany from Hungary, played a decisive role in this. The, the Communist Party actually tried to take over and become the leadership of a farmer labor party uh, when what they, you know, Cannon and others knew they, they really should have been doing was, in fact, uh, you know, making their uh, allies with. Uh, what was a weak leadership, and waiting until that developed into a you know a movement of some force and significance, uh, and and seeing how it developed, rather than making it a paper organization uh, of a communist party, which would then become, in some senses, uh, responsible for a farmer labor politic that it had no real interest uh, in pursuing in terms of the class struggle nature of, 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 of communist orientations. Now, all of this happened as the Communist Party in the United States became increasingly factionalized into kind of, there were three leaderships, really. Cannon, Max Chapman, Martin Abern, and others formed an international labor defense organization uh, that was their bailiwick defending Sacco and Vanzetti, defending immigrant and other workers victimized in the, in the bourgeois courts, uh, and, and providing aid to political prisoners. Uh, William Z. Foster had a stranglehold over the trade union you know, work of the Communist Party. 
and Jay Lovestone ended up running the sort of party apparatus, uh, largely centered in New York or Chicago. In some senses, Stalin and his emissaries encouraged this balkanization because they could play one contingent off against another to make sure that none of them had sufficient power to actually challenge what was going on in terms of uh, Stalin's increasingly interventionist role in the American party. And this, you know, this came to a head when at conferences where leaders would be elected and they would get a cable from Moscow overturning the actual election of the leadership of the Communist Party of the America. The joke that was circulating in Brooklyn, you know, the joke that was circulating in the Communist Party was why is the party like the Brooklyn Bridge? Because it's suspended by cables. Um, and cables so from Russia. All of is. this, all of this took place without any understanding that there was really a left opposition emerging in Russia over the course of the 1920s, in which Trotsky, but many others, were centrally involved. Cannon, in fact, voted against Trotsky in you know, central committee meetings in the American party in the mid-1920s, and he knew nothing, nothing really about Trotsky. He was really increasingly disillusioned and disaffected with the factionalism that was stymieing the party that he had helped to build and that he saw as the answer, the revolutionary answer uh, to American working class struggles. But he couldn't step out of, and he, he wrote this later, he couldn't step outside of his own embeddedness in some senses in the parochialism of the American imbroglio, if you will. Um, he got pressured. He went to Moscow a number of times over the course of the 1920s. He didn't even want to go in 1928 to the Sixth Congress of the Communist International. But his faction pressured him to go because they said, look, you've got to be there. We've, we've got to have you know, our main representative on the ground. He went, and with Morris Spector, a Canadian, he got hold of Trotsky's draft program uh, uh, a critique of the Communist International, which highlighted some of these issues, including the Farmer Labor Party question that Cannon had known was instinctually was wrong, but hadn't been able to quite kind of put together what was the problem, as well as China, Russia, and other things. And the two of them read this and hammered it over and, and said, okay. And all of a sudden, Cannon later said, the light went on. What's wrong with what's been wrong with us is actually what's wrong with the common term. And we have to we have to rebuild in some senses what was gained in 1917 and what now is being squandered. We have to bring back revolutionary internationalism. We have to bring back uh, a revolutionary perspective on you know, how to intervene in our own class struggles. We have to bring back the notion that communists have to be allowed in their own national settings, while learning from and being guided by a, by a body like the Comintern, how to forge their own way forward. Uh, and he and Spectre came back to North America with that, you know, as their uh, sort of uh, cause for the foreseeable future. Um, but it meant it meant a tremendous break, you know. This is a professional revolutionary who, from the age of, you know, 17 or 18, uh, when he first joined the IWW, had dedicated himself to the cause of the revolution. He'd become a paid professional, uh, you know, party figure. His entire life, friendships, the wherewithal of his material everyday existence was tied into the party. As he said, it was a tough decision to break from the American Communist Party. He said, I had to leave my swivel chair, you know, sitting in the office, kind of dictating to the stenographer, the, you know, the next revolutionary leaflet. Um, and, you know, that was then, and I guess we'll, we'll talk about that in future questions, that would become the, the trajectory, not just of the next decade when he was building Trotskyism in America, but for the rest of his life.
Yeah, I find this history so informative, not just from the intricacies of uh, Trotskyism and things like that, but also just when it comes to things like uh, Stalinism and Stalinization, because learning about this period and reading also James Buchanan's own writing and own accounts of what was happening, it's really incredible to me the extent to which the Stalinist bureaucracy weakened the Communist parties internationally and how like nefariously they really tried to exert their influence. Like in the US, for example, Cannon describes that the the factions that you were talking about would, you know, seek advice and seek mediation and things like that, apparently from the common term. But they would return to the US then actually in in worse shape and even with more inflamed uh factionalism and things like that. Like it it's really incredible to me learning about this this history uh, when it comes to Stalinization. Oh, yeah, it was, it, you know, by the end of the 20s, it was brutalizing. You know, I mean, and Stalin's arrogance uh, in dealing with revolutionaries in the United States, astounding. Um, I believe it was, you know, Lovestone who finally confronted him in 1928 and 29 in Russia. And he was on the wrong side of the Bukharan, Stalin, fight in, inside the, you know, the, the Russian party, which Stalin would, you know, had won before it started, basically. But, you know, as, as Lovestone was about to par- depart to the United States, Stalin said, sure, he said, you go back to New York. He said, no one will speak to you except your wives. You know, he just had this notion that this was a, you know, this, a party that had been a, you know, a movement, the communist movement, that had been in a movement of debate, discussion, uh, sometimes disagreement, but you know, respectful charting of a revolutionary course, had really degenerated into an you know the rule of an Iron Man in some senses, and his you know hangers-on who were appointed by him to do his bidding, um, and you know, Cannon had lived within that for, as I said, a despairing period in the late 1920s. He was pretty close, I think, to actually not just not perhaps dropping out of the movement, but basically scaling back what he thought the movement was capable of doing, perhaps keeping his job as a professional revolutionary. Um, But, you know, settling into more kind of domestic relations with his friends and and with ties that he longstanding ties to the friends in the movement like William Dunn, who tragically he would break from over this ultimate break. But in the end, uh, he just couldn't stomach it. He had to fight for what he felt were principled beliefs and what he dedicated his life to, which he saw being, in some senses, uh, undermined by the Stalinization of the common turn and its reflection in the American in the American party. I think this brings us up to an extremely pivotal year, to say the very least, which is 1933. So this is the year when, uh, from my understanding, Cannon and the Communist League of America officially break from the Third International. And you mentioned some of the reasons earlier, and obviously there was at this point also um, really important international events like the counter-revolutionary betrayals of the Third International and the Comintern, like, for example, the refusal of the Stalinists and the German Social Democrats to form a united front against uh, fascism. And Cannon at this point writes that the Third International is dead to the revolution, and he actually even says that it's betrayed the proletariat even more shamefully, even more ingloriously than had the Second International uh, back in 1914. So I have a sort of two-part question here, which is, firstly, could you say a bit more about why Trotsky saw the necessity of forming a fourth international at this point? And could you also talk about how the burgeoning U.S. Trotskyist movement uh, took up the task of building this new international? Okay, um, I should maybe pause for a clarification, which is that when Cannon and those that he managed to gather around him were expelled from the Communist Party for embracing Trotskyism in 
in 1928-29. They followed the path that the international left opposition and Trotsky had laid down, which is that as they broke from the Communist Party, either leaving it or being expelled, they nevertheless considered themselves what they called an external opposition to the Communist Party. And their attempt to rebuild the revolutionary uh, uh, movement was oriented thus to the members who stayed inside the Communist Party. They still saw the Communist International and its respective national parties to be the recruiting ground for uh, the revolution, for the rebuilding of the and regroupment of the revolutionary left, and thus they didn't necessarily uh, see themselves as engaging in uh, a lot of work with other left wing organizations. The Communist Party and the Communist International were their target. They consider themselves still part of the Communist International, but because they'd been expelled, they had to be an external tendency within it. Now, over time from 1929 to 1933, it was apparent that that politics and that orientation was in fact holding them back. I think the first inklings of this, and, and this emerged in critiques of this approach inside uh, the Communist League of America by uh, Cannon's younger allies like Max Shackman and others, many others, who wanted to do, who wanted to actually engage more in mass work, more in mass struggles. Uh, more in involving themselves in the in the in the uh, in the politics outside of appealing only to the Communist Party. Now, the CLA did some of that. It was, of course, doing that, but it was always, in some senses, hedged in by what it could do because of its understanding of itself as an external opposition of the Communist Party. What really broke the back of that approach and orientation was the rise of fascism in Germany. And above all, the way that the Communist International reacted to that, which was not to, because this was the period uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 1930s of Stalinism's most lurching turn to the ultra left was called the third period in that period stalin and and moscow which ran certainly from 1928 29 into maybe 1934 35 there was some wavering but basically that's how long it lasted in this third period the communist parties in the common turn said Anybody outside of our ranks is a social fascist. We work with no one outside of our ranks. We don't follow what had been Lenin's policy of borrowing from within, for instance, established trade unions. We set up our own red revolutionary trade unions that will actually, you know, fight the class struggle to the end. Their attitude in Germany with the rise of fascism, you know, have some have summed up as saying, First Hitler, then us. In other words, let Hitler come to power. We'll be there to pick up the pieces. What that backed away from was what Trotsky instinctually knew was the only course, which was to build the broadest possible united front against fascism so that fascism wouldn't be allowed to grow, smash the trade unions, smash the social democratic organizations, and of course, smash the communists in the process, which is exactly what happened. So eventually, Trotsky and Cannon and his comrades in the Communist League of America came to appreciate as the you know, anti-fascist and anti-war movement revved up in the United States, that there was nothing to be gained by keeping alive 
this notion after four years of struggle that we have to consider ourselves aligned with the common turn. We have to recruit only, or we have to recruit, recruit primarily, I should say, Communist Party members and orient primarily to them. And also remember that in this same period, as these kinds of things were happening on the broad international scale of politics, the Stalinists were often vicious in their, you know, homegrown repression of canon and others. Meetings were broken up as, as communist workers were marched into halls where canon was speaking with brass knuckles and furrier's knives. Uh, you know, the, the Communist League of America could barely field a speaker without confronting the worst imaginable kind of forms of Stalinist thuggery, something that had been unknown on the revolutionary left prior to this, but that had existed in some senses in the trade unions, but that had been brought into, you know, uh, the, the communist milieu by uh, Stalinist gangsterism. So after four years of this, all these kinds of struggles, uh, Cannon and, and the Trotskyists and Trotsky leading the way, said, okay, we have to, you know, we are now cutting our ties with the Communist International. It's not that we'll refuse, to, you know, to, to, you know, to speak to dissident communist workers who come to us, uh, but we are no longer seeing that as the primary struggle. And that opened the door to mass, to involvement in mass struggles of the American working class, mass involvement in mass mobilizations, uh, uh, you know, of unemployed workers, of prisoner defense struggles like that organized around the Tom Mooney, Free Tom Mooney campaign. A whole series of doors were thus opened to the Trotskyists. And it started to bear fruit, particularly in 19, late 1933, 1934, um, with various class struggles and, you know, other, other uh, mobilizations that we'll probably talk about. Yeah, I would love to turn to talking a little bit about these um, struggles and mass mobilizations uh, in among the U.S. working class that you just mentioned that the U.S. Trotskyists were then able to take part in in the in the 1930s. So the U.S. Trotskyists played a big role in the struggles in Minneapolis in particular, and James P. Cannon himself said that these struggles were a crucial test for American Trotskyists. Could you talk a bit about these struggles and mass mobilizations and the ways in which they were important for building a revolutionary party, but also for making inroads into broader sectors of the working class? Yeah, um, the background to the to the Minneapolis uh, Teamster strikes of 1934 that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute were uh, Trotskyist uh, involvements in two uh, other sectors uh, that, that in some senses preceded Minneapolis and from which uh, Cannon and others learned a great deal. Uh, one was uh, they did a great deal of work in the early 1930s in a dissident miners movement in Illinois called the Progressive Miners Movement. Um, it was an uphill battle. Uh, they had some people on the ground there who were very influential. They always had to kind of work with them closely, and they never were able to actually assimilate them to revolutionary politics. Um, but in those struggles, they did learn a great deal, including uh, uh, the very important role that women in masculinist fields like mining could play in mass struggles. Um, so the progressive miners had a women's auxiliary that played a, you know, just a dynamic role in the struggle and in picket lines uh, and, in, you know, prisoner support and in, in raising funds and money and in standing behind, uh, you know, the, the, the men who were actually on strike. Um, so that was, the, and that would, uh, I think, uh, school canon and others. Um, in, you know, in, in the necessity of sort of bringing women into struggles, even when the work sectors were overwhelmingly, and they really were overwhelmingly male. 
Um, the other strike that happened that in some senses put uh, Cannon uh, and the Communist League of America on the map was a major uh, hotel strike uh, in 1933-34 in New York City, um, which was led by a mercurial element who'd gravitated to the Communist League of America named B.J. Field. Um, he had befriended Trotsky. He was a very uh, able economist, uh, and he was precipitated into a leadership of this strike by uh, um, the fact that he spoke many languages and the French chefs were very enamored of him. He was their Napoleon. Um, but uh, while well, he gravitated to the uh, Communist League of America, again, like some of their leaders, the le key leaders in the progressive miners of Illinois, he was never really assimilated to the politics of the Communist League of America and to Trotskyism. Uh, and in the end, uh, while Cannon, Shackman, uh, um, uh, uh, um, Hugo Oler and many other other figures of long standing in the Trotskyist movement played a decisive role in the in the uh, in the hotel strike. Um, they ended up uh, that strike ended up being lost. Field ended up being expelled. Uh, and uh, but uh, Cannon and the Communist League of America showed in some senses that they could be active participants in the class struggle, but that they had a perspective that allowed them, and that in fact made it imperative for them uh, to uh, keep a kind of disciplined reign over uh, sort of mavericks, uh, even among their own ranks like Field. And in some senses, in expelling Field, they showed that, okay, we're not going to behave in an opportunistic way, as in fact so many Communist Party, you know, uh, strikes had been led astray by opportunistic uh, um, turns. Um, and this, I think the fruits of all of this were uh, borne out in the sort of just immensely important Minneapolis Teamster strikes of 1934. Minneapolis had been a center of Cannon's recruitment to the Communist League of America uh, from the very early days. There were three brothers there who were brothers of his very good friend, who, as I said, he broke from Bill Dunn. Uh, there was uh, Vincent Ray Dunn, Miles Dunn, and Grant Dunn. Uh, and along with uh, um, uh, Carl Skoglund, a Scandinavian former Wobbly, uh, they were the leadership of uh, the Minneapolis uh, Teamsters. And they had been working on organizing uh, uh, the coal yard workers uh, since the late 20s. Um, but they had a very protracted understanding and they confronted an international brotherhood of Teamsters that considered itself a craft union and uh, therefore sort of above and beyond the, you know, the masses of workers who worked in the transportation sector, who worked in markets and, and, and you know, hauled Called you know crates of groceries and and you know and other things and uh, chickens they called them chicken pluckers. Um, the point about what the Trotskyists managed to do in the course of one year and three strikes. I mean, imagine that. Imagine a union today going through three strikes in one year. It's unfathomable, right? In one year by 1934, and they'd been at it for, as I said, for five, six years and more, a small group, a nucleus of Trotskyists, managed to take a union that had a membership of less than 150 to a union with 7,000 members. They turned an open shop town, which is what Minneapolis had been in the 1920s, into a bastion of trade union defense. And the entire trade union movement was galvanized by this. The strikes were bloody. They faced not only recalcitrant employers who had, you know, who tried to inf infiltrate their ranks with stool pigeons. They faced a, a resolute sort of army of police, a municipal leader, the mayor, who was as tightly sort of bound in with capital as it's possible to imagine. And even more importantly, in some ways, 
they face down a governor of the state, Floyd Olson, who was a farmer labor governor and who sort of wore the hat of a friend of the working man at the same time that he would send the National Guard in to break the strike. Now, this is a formidable array of opponents to find yours, as well as, by the way, Roosevelt's you know, national uh, labor mediators who were sent in to try to, you know, unctuously dripping with, you know, offers of good intentions to bring the workers and the, and the bosses together. Um, this was an amazing battle in 1934. And 1934 was a year that saw workers, in some senses, climb out of the doldrums of the Great Depression and begin to fight back. It took that long. Really, there were virtually no struggles or strikes of much consequence from 29 to 32. Uh, and, you know, people were mired in unemployment. The Great Depression was a depressing phenomenon. 1934 saw three strikes that fought against this. The Minneapolis truckers, the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the auto parts workers in Toledo led by a, a, a group uh, headed up by A.J. Musty, a radical, uh, uh, pacifist turned radical turned revolutionary, and Harry Bridges and the Communist Party's uh, leadership of the Longshoremen in San Francisco. All of these strikes took place, by the way, outside of the ranks of the red, quote, sectarian unions that the Communist Party had been trying to set up. They were all strikes that took place in, in workplaces where the American Federal, the Conservative American Federation of Labor had actually, you know, sunk its tentacles. Of those strikes, the Minneapolis uh, Teamster strikes were the most successful, the mo most resolute, uh, and uh, in some senses paved the way for the great upheavals of the Congress of Industrial Organization, mass production, industrial unionism in 1937 of which the Flint sit-down strike was, you know, one sort of major momentous event. And even John L. Lewis, who was the, in some senses the, the main uh, sort of bureaucratic architect of some of those uh, CIO struggles, he looked at Minneapolis in 1934, and he saw the blood in the streets, and he saw the writing in the wall because of what the Trotskyists had done there. Um, so it was a momentous struggle, and you know it was run. The strikes were run with military discipline. Um, they had huge headquarters set up. They had nurses and doctors set up to look after people that they knew would be physically, you know, damaged in the struggle. Um, they put out their own newspaper, a daily newspaper, the Organizer, which countered the bosses' claims in the mainstream press. They formed a vibrant women's auxiliary which, you know, did domestic labor like feeding and the workers who came into this, this strike hall, but also, you know, was active in, you know, in, 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 in keeping women involved in the struggle. Uh, picket line duty. There's a, one of the great photographs in my, um, in my book is of two women squaring off in a picket line battle with clubs, a, you know, a bourgeois woman and a, you know, a proletarian woman, and they, they are fighting in the street. Um, now, that was rare. There were far more men who fought, but that happened, and it broke, in some senses, uh, down the, the sort of gendered sort of barriers of women's involvement in the class struggle. So, you know, you, uh, there's, if you can't pick up the hefty, you know, volume of canon uh, that has this account, there is a separate book that Haymarket published uh, a few years ago uh, called Revolutionary Teamsters, which is about the, the trucker strikes of 1934. Yeah, it's such an incredible and powerful story, like the the amount of effort and the amount of planning, like you mentioned about the the press that they were publishing at the time, the the militancy, the the resoluteness. It's, yeah, really, really powerful stuff. And I... I mean, speaking of, you mentioned earlier, A.J. Musty, I wanted to move forward a bit to kind of the end of this period that we're discussing, like around 1938. And I want to get to um, 
the the SWP, the Socialist Workers Party. Could you describe uh, some of the key events that led up to the founding of the Socialist Workers Party, especially things like the entry into the Socialist Party? And could you comment also on like what kind of party can and hope to build with the SWP? Yeah, I, I mean, when Cannon wrote about the Minneapolis uh, um, strikes of 1934 and their successes, he always made the point that the reason these struggles had come to their the, the success that they did was because there was behind them a disciplined uh, kernel of a party in the Communist uh, League of America. That it, and he wasn't uh, uh, saying that the party controlled everything because so many events happen in a struggle that are not controlled, that are outside the, the you know, the dimensions of control of any, you know, uh, individual group of people or, or organization. But he did see that it was that that, that the existence of that kernel of a, a party allowed for the leadership to take positions and have a perspective on the struggle that was both realistic and that would move the struggle forward. He never said, and this is so different from what the Communist Party, you know, apparatchiks in the trade unions often said, he never said this was a revolutionary event, the strike of 1934. He said it's a struggle for trade union recognition. It's a struggle for better conditions. We lead it on that basis. We strive to achieve ends on that basis. And in doing that, we convince workers that we have a, a foresight and a, lar- you know, a larger perspective and that we are good leaders, that we, are, we have their interests at heart. And out of that will come recruits to a movement. And you know, we will build a party on that basis, not by proclaiming every strike a great victory and not by saying we have to fight in the streets to defeat you know, all of our enemies at this moment which he, he, he maintained, 1934. It's not a revolutionary moment. It is not. Unlike the Communist Party, who claimed that it was, and that attacked the, you know, the leadership of the Minneapolis general strike, for instance, for not uh, bringing the government down, attacking the governor. What Cannon always said is, no, what we do with the governor is that we take his two-faced kind of approach to being a friend of the worker on the on 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 Monday, but sending in the National Guard on Wednesday, we take that and we exploit that. We take the you know the the space that that offers us to wring from him what we can get. We understand he's not our friend. We teach the workers he's not our friend, but we don't you know take up arms you know and you know assail the state capital, which is actually you know in some senses I'm a, being a bit hyperbolic here, what the CP was actually arguing that they should do. I mean, it was incredible. So um, uh, he always said, Cannon, this revolutionary leadership is central. So after you go through a strike like that, then, you know, what's the next step? Well, there could be many more strikes. And the Trotskyists would have, had they had the numbers, involved themselves in those strikes. But what it was also important to do was to try to regroup the, the, the fragmented elements of the potentially revolutionary left into a larger you know, party that could actually have the capacity to rival the communists. Remember, the, the communists were hundreds of times bigger than the Trotskyists as, a, as, an, organ, as a, an organization on the left. I mentioned, you know, and you mentioned Musty and the Toledo strike. Well, the workers, the the Musty had formed uh, the American Workers Party. And what Toledo and Minneapolis did was in some senses show that these, the, the American Workers Party and the Communist League of America were on a similar trajectory. They both had a critique of, of the Stalinists and the Communist Party. They both believed in, you know, in, in, in essentially a politics of class struggle. 
So the first, you know, step towards the creation of the of the of the SWP and this larger party was a fusion of the American Workers Party and uh, the Communist League of America. And so they formed a group called uh, the Workers Party. And Cannon and Musty were actually very close for a time, spoke together on many podiums, and many, many very good recruits to Trotskyism were won by this fusion. People who stayed firm canonists for the rest of their lives. As this is happening, Trotsky was trying to negotiate how to, you know, actually bring the left together uh, in Europe. How to, you know, actually put into practice the politics of anti-fascism that would, you know, the United Front politics of anti-fascism that were needed, and to build an organ, you know. To, to build the international left opposition into a more powerful force. And he devised a, you know, a, a, a project in this same period called the French Turn, in which the Trotskyist groups, which were small, would enter, for instance, the French Socialist Party, where there were masses of workers who were rising up angry and who were apart from and distinct from the Communist Party, which was, of course, very large and hegemonic uh, on the French left. The Trotskyists in America, after the fusion with the Mustyites, uh, said, okay, well, we can, make a, we can make a similar turn, enter into the Socialist Party in, 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 uh, in the United States. And the Socialist Party at that time, led by Norman Thomas, in the early 1930s, was getting a sizable, you know, vote in in in, in electoral presidential con contests, and because things were starting to move in the Great Depression, youth were being radicalized, workers were being, you know, saw in the 1934 struggles and other class conflicts uh, that it was possible to actually struggle against the confinements of the Great Depression and and and. And capitalist employment, so there were there was all kinds of things happening that suggested that we you know that a move into the socialist party might garner victories and recruits for Trotskyism. Um, so in 1936-37, the uh, the Workers' Party formally dissolved and its members entered into the Socialist Party. Now, they kept uh, an actual organizational apparatus clandestinely alive. They had a, you know, a committee that met regularly in New York. But the dangers of this turn into the Socialist Party was how would it be actually you know, undertaken? And Cannon ended up being, and this is, I think, one of the most original and most developed and most significant parts of the book. Cannon ended up almost standing ground alone. He had an instinctual kind of affinity with what Trotsky's view on entry was, but he had to fight people like Max Shackman and even old allies like uh, Arnie Swabeck. By this time, Musty had gone. He'd reconverted to uh, religion. He'd had a epiphany in a in a you know uh, in, in 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 a church in Paris, and he'd gone back to the church. But his followers, for the most part, remained. Um, Cannon's approach to the entry was very unlike that of his comrades who stayed in New York City. Their orientation was basically to try to hitch their wagon to the cart of a group that seemed to be a leaning left in the leadership, but separate from Norman Thomas, a group called the Militants. Now, many of them would later be called the, the Clarity Group and the Clarityites. Cannon originally probably thought that this might not be a bad way to go, but he was always prone when faced with a kind of a crisis 
to want to go on the road and kind of resume his agitational role that he had, you know, so sort of cherished when he was an IWW hobo activist. And what he did was he went on the road and he went to California where he set up basically uh, a newspaper, Labor Action, and where he almost came close to taking over the uh, Socialist Party. He hooked up with a Socialist Party militant, a guy named uh, Trimble. And, you know, together they, al along with work in the uh, um, uh, Sailors Union of the Pacific and other maritime unions, they developed connections to the working class. They developed, uh, you know, a, a, a very strong presence uh, in the Socialist Party of California. And all the while, Cannon knew eventually the shoe is going to drop. The leadership of the party, Socialist Party, is not going to tolerate us doing this. You know, the sort of sectarian dismissal of Trotskyists is that, is that they're splitters and wreckers. Cannon's active activity in the Socialist Party was anything but. He was a builder. Now, he was building by intervening in class struggles, by drawing to him radicalized revolutionary youth and workers from the Socialist Party, and by showing them this is the way forward. But he also spoke at electoral rallies for Norman Thomas. He built the Socialist Party. He created a newspaper. Um, in the end, yes. The, you know, Norman Thomas and the leadership and the militants and the Clarityites, they all moved against him. And he ended up at least, he, ultimately, Shackman and those around him came to see that both Trotsky and Cannon were right. We have, you know, we are going to get expelled. And they were. But when they were expelled, they took with them a significant sector of the Socialist Party's radicalizing youth and militant workers. And that was the background to the formation, I believe, on New Year's Day, 1938, of the Socialist Workers' Party, a party that Cannon saw and Trotsky recognized as the leading, largest, and most significant class struggle steeled Trotskyist organization in what would be formed later that summer as the Fourth International. Um, it was really um, the American Trotsky mo Trotskyist movement that carried international Trotskyism into the 1940s. Um, and the party that Cannon uh, saw as central to his you know, political project, the Socialist Workers Party, was the kind of party that he always envisioned uh, could be created out of the sort of degeneration of the communist uh, international. It was a party of class struggle, a party that interacted with the working class on a realist, not an otherworldly basis, a party that, you know, while there was democratic centralism and while there had to be discipline, it also had room for discussion. Uh, and dissidents, uh, and uh, sometimes that dissidence would, would end up breaking from the SWP, as it did in a series of faction fights in which people like uh, um, Goldwyn, Morrow, C.L.R. James, uh, um, Cochran, and others in the 40s and 50s would establish. But the party that Cannon wanted to build was a revolutionary organization on the Bolshevik model that was disciplined, centralist, but democratic, that was class struggle oriented, and that could build uh, coalitions and movements and alliances with wider uh, social movements like the civil rights struggle, uh, and that would actually uh, unite an, a fragmented American working class in the realization of the kind of socialist dream that he always saw as both necessary and possible. We're kind of 
wrapping up this conversation at, at a, a bit of a funny point because now we're actually at the the start of the SWP's long history and the the first years of the fourth international. So in this sense, there are many, many decades left of American Trotskyism to cover in the future. And there's, of course, much more to cover in terms of James P. Cannon's life. But as a way of concluding today, I kind of wanted to circle back to Trotsky and um, Trotsky's view of this movement, the American Trotskyist movement. So Trotsky was really enthusiastic about this American section of the Fourth International. And Cannon wrote actually in 1953, quote, that Trotsky leaned so heavily on the Americans and was so anxious to strengthen their authority in the international that when he drew up the transitional program, he wrote it first for the SWP. So one of my last questions to you today really is, why did Trotsky see so much potential in this relatively small group of U.S. communists? Well, I think Trotsky saw the, the importance of the American contingent um, because that, that body of revolutionaries had actually intersected with the class struggles of the United States, particularly in Minneapolis in 1934, in such dramatic and successful ways. Um, the transitional program, which Trotsky drafted and which he, you know, which he ran by the leadership of the American uh, um, Trotskyist movement, had in fact been crafted in part out of conversations that he had with Cannon, Shackman, Rose Karstner, who was Cannon's partner, uh, and others uh, in Mexico, uh, you know, in the late 30s. Cannon had also seen, or Trotsky had also seen that not only was the, was his, were his American followers the most uh, adroit at, you know, in, you know intersecting uh, the class struggles in their national settings, they had also been the most uh, supportive of his own plight in the later 30s and before his, indeed, before his assassination in, in 1940, uh, you know, in, in his struggles against Stalinist calumny and defamation. So that it, it had been the American Trotskyist movement that had actually put together the uh, um, Dewey Commission that explored the allegations uh, that, that had come out of the uh, Communist International in the, you know, in the wake of the Moscow trials that Trotsky had colluded with fascists, that he was a capitalist agent, et cetera, et cetera. All of them lies. Uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was figures, uh, it, it was the Trotskyist movement in the United States that had bankrolled much of the uh, um, you know, uh, production of the international uh, Trotskyist movement and the Fourth International uh, in terms of their publications, Trotsky's writings. Uh, and it was it was it was Cannon's uh, followers who went down to be bodyguards, you know, in, in, in Mexico when when Trotsky faced repeated assassination attempts, ultimately and tragically successful. Um, so you really didn't have any other uh, Trotskyist movement uh, that had this record, you know, of achievement. And in fact, when, you know, Cannon was, uh, who spoke no foreign languages, when he went to Europe uh, for the founding convention of the Fourth International, which was a small and class clandestine affair t taking place, you know, when war was happening and, and uh, as, uh, or on the eve of war, and as, as Trotsky has feared assassination, uh, not only from Stalinists, but also from fascists, um, you know, uh, Trotsky wrote, wrote to praise Cannon's role in bringing together the forces of the Fourth International to Rose Karstner. He said, and he said, you know, we could use a lot more gyms over here. Um, so, uh, and he had far more, and I, I show this in, in detail in the book, he had far more trust, for instance, in Cannon's kind of resolute proletarian uh, uh, revolutionism than he did in, 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 in Shackman's, who, while Shackman had a, 
felicity with European languages and got along exceedingly well with elements uh, of the European Trotskyist milieu and was in fact far more comfortable than canon in those circles. Um, Trotsky, uh, you know, understood that, you know, Shackman was a more of a mercurial kind of chummy uh, political figure who might, you know, um, miss or actually obfuscate, you know, uh, opportunistic tendencies uh, and and a drift uh, in, in 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 wrong directions. Um, you know, Trotsky had a and and Cannon. It should be said, very early in their you know the relationship of the Communist League of America with Trotsky, Cannon didn't wasn't necessarily willing to jump on the bandwagon and, Im, and just implicitly trust Trotsky. Uh, he tested him a couple of times in the early 30s to see. He wanted to know, is this guy going to function the same way, you know, that the, you know, the the apparatchiks and the, you know, the Stalinist emissaries functioned in the Communist Party in the 20s? Because I'm not going to, you know, put up with that if that's the case. Um, but uh, they had a, a very a comradely, of course, but also I think just a a deeply respectful and intuitively aligned with one another. Cannon, of course, was not Trotsky in th- terms of his theoretical acumen and his, you know, his just uh, capacities uh, on an abstract level. But he was precisely the kind of concrete proletarian, you know, activist that Trotsky knew any revolution was going to be dependent upon. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you so much for for being here for taking the time to talk to us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. It was it was great. I appreciated your questions and it's been fun. Hopefully we'll do it on the third volume. Definitely. Would love that. <laughs>